Hi, everyone. Welcome. It looks like we have a couple of folks uh, starting to trickle in here. Thank you so much for joining Vosel's Masterclass. This is the first one in our series for 2021, and we're just really excited to have you all here. In just a moment, I'm going to introduce myself and talk a little bit more about what we'll what we'll be discussing tonight. Um, but we'll give a, just a minute for everyone to come into the room. And as you're coming in, we're going to try to build some community here in the chat. So go ahead and uh, type in there for us, if you don't mind, uh, your name, where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, and if you have any little ones, this could be you know, your own kiddo, grand kiddo, uh, children that you care for, feel free to put their names and their ages in the chat box as well. So we can get to know who's here just a little bit. And for those of you who are just, just coming into the Zoom room, um, I'm Jesse Ilhart here from Vosel. And we are gonna get started in just a few minutes, but so that we can build some community, uh, please go ahead and share in the chat box um, if you feel so inclined um, to share with us uh, your name, uh, where you're coming to us from, and if you have kiddos yourself um, or children, you know, grandchildren, uh, children that you care for, um, go ahead and put their names and ages if you'd like into the chat box as well. And we have a really, really wonderful um, that group that's joining here tonight that's RSVP'd. Um, it's a really great mix of parents, caregivers, uh, grandparents, educators, uh, and early learning advocates. So a really wonderful mix of people sort of all coming together um, you know, kind of commonly bound by this uh, united front that we care about young people and want the very best for them and are here together sort of humbly working side by side to make that happen. So um, thank you all for being a part of that community here tonight. Uh, and uh, we'll get started in just a moment. I see we have some folks here in the chat who are um, some, some teachers. So I'm glad to have some teachers in the house um, and, and folks who are parents themselves. So that's great. Uh, really glad to see that. And uh, in just a moment, we're gonna get started and I'll introduce you to our special guests as well. Um, we have two, uh, two wonderful folks here tonight who are really experts in this space and are going to share some of their, um, their shop thoughts and guidance with everyone. Um, I know this was uh, kind of a, a commonly requested topic among uh, families, members of our VOCEL programs, as well as our VOCEL broader community. So really excited to kick off our masterclass series with this topic, how to talk with kids about race. Um, so to get started, uh, for those of you who have come in more recently, my name is Jesse Ilhart. I am Bosell's co-founder and our executive director. Uh, this is our second year uh, doing a masterclass series, and we're really excited um, to continue this opportunity to convene together as a community and talk about topics that are really important um, to any number of people um, who are connected to Bosell. So I want to start tonight um, with this excerpt. Uh, it's from a book called A Kid's Book About Racism. Um, and this expert from the author Jelani Memory says, I'm proud of who I am and the color of my skin, but because of my skin color, people aren't always nice to me. Sometimes I get called names. Other times it's worse. The person doing it might not even realize that it hurts me a lot. And when they treat me that way, it makes me feel small. You see, some people believe that having different color skin means you aren't as good as others. That's called racism. And I chose to share Jelani's words tonight because I think they, they really frame up this, uh, this masterclass. And they're an amazing reminder for me um, of what 
I think is a concern for so many parents and caregivers and educators that a topic that might seem as complex as race and racism um, might be something that's tough to talk about with young children. Um, and I think Jelani puts it so well and is this reminder that you know we can talk with kids in ways that are age appropriate and use words and phrases that kids will really understand. Um, so I thought, again, it was just a nice, a nice framing for, for tonight's topic. To give you a little bit of an understanding of where, where we're going tonight, um, we are uh, uh, recording this webinar, so uh, that will be shared afterwards. So you should really feel free to sit back, relax, have this hour um, to yourself to, to really learn and listen and not worry about jotting down everything that you hear. This recording will be sent out to everyone. Um, we hope that you will engage in the chat. So whether it's you know, introducing yourself, um, adding questions, maybe making comments if something really resonates with you, um, please feel free to use the chat. You can also submit questions using the Q&A button. So those are questions that will come directly to us and we will be able to um, then uh, use those questions and bring them to our panelists or to our guest experts tonight. And then finally, I wanna share that there is really a beauty, um, beautiful diversity of backgrounds here in this session tonight. So we have folks coming, like I said, who are parents, parents of kids, who are grown, little ones, grandparents, um, educators, early learning advocates. So folks will be coming from all different perspectives um, and that's something for us to just keep in mind as we're going through tonight's topic. So before I pass it over um, to our guests, I wanna just give a very brief introduction to Vosel for anyone who is here tonight who might be new to our organization. So VOSEL stands for Viewing Our Children as Emerging Leaders. Um, we are a nonprofit here in Chicago who helps ensure every child has the foundation to learn, grow, and lead. And so what we do more specifically is we strengthen the capacity of parents, caregivers and educators to help their young children thrive. Um, and we do that through child-focused programming in overburdened, under-resourced communities, where we really use a community approach to build parents, caregivers, educators, competence in child development, and also resilience to navigate the challenges of raising or educating young children. Um, so all of our programs provide a combination of resources, tools, and then the support of a peer community. And specifically to this topic, talking with kids about race, I wanna share two points um, of strategies that we sort of use at BOSEL. Um, first, our philosophy, when we think about how young children learn, um, how young children process the world around them, um, we know that sometimes they have big questions or they have big observations. And so at BOSEL, we have a philosophy that it is okay for folks, whether young or old, um, to feel their feelings and to share their ideas and ask questions. And so it's really important um, you know, especially with race and topics like race and racism, um, that we're making sure children don't feel like any anything's taboo, right? Um, that we're sending the message that we're open to children's ideas and their curiosity and really eager to talk with them about it. And then additionally, we think about the stories that we're reading in classes, making sure that children see themselves in the books, um, making sure that we're not only thinking about um, the books and the diversity of characters, but also who are the people who are writing the books and who are the people who are illustrating them. Um, so thinking about that idea of kind of like own voices, own stories, um, and then talking with children also about that, who did write this book, right? Um, and, and then thinking finally about who are the people that are reading the books as well. So Vosel has a live story time every other Friday on our Facebook page at 10 a.m. And we work hard to make sure that we have guest readers who um, really represent the backgrounds and the diversity of Chicago, um, including uh, readers who are speaking um, and reading in Spanish as well as a lot of our classes um, and a lot of our members um, speak Spanish at home. So um, those are some of the ways that we approach this at Bocell. Um, the beauty of master classes, I think, is that 
we are eager to bring experts to you who can share much more about the topic um, and, and give some guidance uh, on something that we know is really important to you. So from here, I'm going to introduce our two guests for tonight. Um, and we are really grateful to have them here with us. So we have Matt and Simone, who are both practitioners at Erickson Institute. Um, and they've also started working together more recently on a new endeavor that they'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, so Nat and Simone are right here. Thank you both for being here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse. And thank you so much, Fozelle, for having Simone and me today. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have all of you. And we have already felt that sense of community and solidarity in the chat. So we're so excited to share what we love about empowering you to have this conversation at home. And before we do that, we want to ground ourselves in our intention. Because when we talk about race and racism, it can be so activating, whether it's mobilizing us towards action or trapping us in that shame and guilt cycle. And at Come Back to Care, we really believe that we can ground ourselves by coming back to our core values. And with that, my invitation to you is to ask you, who are you doing this work for? Is it yourself? Is it your little ones? Is it your student? Is it your ancestors? Is it from the past generations? What's your intention and who you're doing this work for? And please take a moment to drop it in the chat so that we can arrive here together. for future generations and future students, mm -hmm. for your preschoolers, for your family and future children. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm go also going to share my screen now or accessibility check. I just want to make sure that everyone can see the screen okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Today, what we're going to cover are three things. We're going to cover why having this conversation can be difficult for us. And then we're going to move into how are our little ones learning about race and racism at such an early age? And then we're going to end with some practice together so that we can walk away with some concrete tools and some game plan of what we can do before, during, and after the talk. Simone and I really would love for you to walk away from our session together with some awareness, especially why this is hard, and some action. And today we're going to share our four S's, our baby shock doo-doo technique, and so much more. But most importantly, we really want you to walk away with some agility, agility and flexibility to step in and out of that shame and guilt cycle so that you can move through what's called clean pain or discomfort, and then you can move into action from a much heart-centered space. And before we do that, I would love to share with you a little bit about Come Back to Care, which is the company that I started. At Come Back to Care, we do two things, three ways. We address the intergenerational family trauma, and then we address the internalized oppression so that parents and caregivers can really understand these two invisible roadblocks that keep showing up in their parenting. And we do this so that we can transform our autopilot caregiving into bold, conscious, and decolonized caregiving. But most of the time, because perfection is not true. And through these 
program that we've created, we call the in, out, and through method. And the in, out, and through is basically going inside of ourselves and coming out the other side of the pain and break through what we thought was impossible. And when we go in, out, and through, in both social justice advocacy and parenting, we always come back to care because that's what we believe parenting is all about. It's all about coming back to care, connection, and compassion. And today I'm so excited to share how we can ground in, out, and through into our conversation with our little ones about race. So we're going to go reflect in and reflect and understand our privilege and also our discomfort. And then we're going to have the talk where we're going to implement the four S's and then through, which is moving through our discomfort so that we can use our privilege creatively. And for our grounding values, everyone has privileges. So we're going to use this as a special assignment so that we can use creativity when we exercise our privileges. For example, my social identity, one of them is an Asian immigrant. And that identity has a lot of oppression ties to it. However, my other social identities include being in an able body and having the privilege of being educated. So I'm using these two privileges by developing this workshop and sharing this skill with you. And the second one is that everyone has biases. So our task or responsibility is to disconfirm them actively with flexibility and honesty. As you all know, that it's so hard to confront our implicit biases. That's why we bring in honesty and courage into this work before we invite our little ones to do the same. For example, a lot of times Uber drivers often ask me in a chit chat that, oh, what do you do? And I often say, oh, I'm a therapist. And immediately, seven out of 10 times, they often say, oh, a massage therapist. And I'm saying this to give you an example that because of how I look and how I present, they already form the prejudge or prejudice idea that because I look this way, a therapist means a massage therapist. So when I have the energy and time and willingness, I use those moments to disconfirm their biases that, oh, actually, I'm a social worker. And the third grounding value is there's no right way to have the discussion. The only wrong way is not to have them. And you're not too late at all. Your parents and caregivers who are here in solidarity, you're already practicing trial and error on a daily basis. You're already implementing so many things without a manual, without a GPS guiding you. So you're really taking a deep dive into the unknown through your parenting and caregiving on a daily basis. So Simone and I would love to invite for you to bring the same grit and tenacity to this work to this conversation with our little ones about race. And you're not too early. Today, we're going to cover some developmental milestones that are inclusive to show that our little ones have been ready. They have been forming the social categories. They have been forming biases, primed and ready for us to go in and disrupt that formation. And lastly, just practice just practice because your action is the solution. So why is this talk so hard for us to have? Because it's not just you, it's all of us. It's hard for all of us to talk about. So as Nat mentioned, we all have personal roadblocks that make this such a difficult conversation. And one of them is our own brain, right? When we are overwhelmed by stress, we have so much going on, we can't really think clearly and we can't do the best that we're trying to do because sometimes we're in that fight, flight, or freeze mode. And in those moments, we're not operating from that smart part of the brain, the neocortex that offers that higher thinking. 
and it gets in the way of us having these important conversations. Another personal roadblock is our ego. Sometimes we're stuck in this false binary of, am I nice versus am I a racist? Well, the reality is we're all racist when we don't take action to disrupt that white body supremacy. We're all partaking in racism when we don't have these conversations. So instead of this binary, we can ask ourselves, how am I showing up with all of my identities, my privilege, my position and my power? How do I show up? And then also there's culture. We don't live in a bubble, right? We can't just look at our brain and our mind and call it a day. So when we put ourselves in a historical context, it becomes clear that many of us are byproducts of generations of colorblindness. How many times have we heard people say, I don't see color? There's one race, the human race, right? White supremacist characteristics. There's the comfort over conflict. I don't wanna talk about it because it's gonna make people uncomfortable. The confrontation, right? The perfectionism. I don't know how I'm gonna say this correctly, so maybe I'll just wait to have this conversation. Many of us are byproducts of years and years of trauma responses, right? For many families, there's a lot of pain and a lot of fear in talking about these things. And we wanna protect our kids and not scare them. And so these parenting behaviors of keeping our children alive and preparing them for the dangers of life, it impacts the way we talk to them and what we talk to them about. And for some parents, we have to teach our children to respond to and live in spite of and survive racism. So before we talk about self-compassion, because self-compassion is so popular now, we have to really understand ourselves and we have to understand those roadblocks, what's getting in the way. And then after we understand those things, we can bring in compassion. And it's only then that we can move into action from a much more centered and aligned place. So at Come Back to Care, that calls this contextualized, not condoning. So from that heart-centered place, we have to move beyond the surface level performative action. And we have to move beyond the self-shaming and go beyond that to the, the thoughts and prayers and the love and light. And we'll do this together. And now we're going to move on to take a deep dive into how our little ones learn about race and racism. And my invitation to you is to look at these four bullet points, and I'm going to, going to read each one out loud. And my invitation is for you to take a mental checklist and make those check marks in the behavior that you observe at home or in your classroom. So if your little one can describe the physical trait whether through verbal communication or other means of communication. I have curly hair. I have blue eyes. I have long hair. The second one, if your little ones can describe their action, for example, I can roll my wheelchair really fast or I jump super high. And the third one, if your little ones can describe the traditional gender binary of male and female, for example, I'm a boy and she's a girl. And last one, if your little ones can communicate using personal pronouns, for example, I, me, my, my, and in our most favorite phrase, my turn, my cookie, all those things. So if you check either one or all four of these behaviors, check boxes, it means that our little ones have been so ready. They have the, their sense of self quickly forming. They have been learning so much about the world, about themselves, and how to treat other people, 
based on the prejudices and biases that are forming in their environment, especially in how we, the caregivers, respond to people who are different, respond to people who look familiar and similar. And based on the social learning theory, any values that we want to teach our little ones get formed with these three components, association, modeling, and reinforcement. For example, if we want to teach our little ones how to be kind, we teach our little ones by perhaps saying, it's better to be kind than to be right. Perhaps at a dinner table, perhaps that's a family gathering. And there's so many moments that our little ones get to hear this verbal modeling. But it's not just verbal modeling. We also model this value of kindness through our action as well. So our little ones get to see us share, get to see us be kind to other people all the time. So this modeling is so key. So with all, all of these opportunities that they get to see this modeling, our little ones start to form these association between this behavior of being kind and the value of, oh, being kind is a positive thing. Being kind is a nice thing to do. And then they get to get to see these two boxes reinforced and confirmed that, wow, by being kind, I get praised. By being kind, my teacher says positive things about me. By being kind, I get that smile and nod from my caregiver. And the opposite is also true. When it comes to race and racism, our little ones have these associations building all the time, whether it's through books, media, news. For example, they might hear that immigrants steal jobs. Immigrants are bad. So these social categories or boxes of associations, one is immigrant, one is bad. Immigrant, trustworthy, untrustworthy, I'm sorry, are starting to form. And perhaps when our little ones go into a classroom and there's a classmate who's an immigrant and that classmate got teased and everybody laughs, that's another opportunity for that association of immigrant, bad, gets confirmed or reinforced. So through their daily experiences, our little ones get so many opportunities for these associations to be confirmed, for these biases to be reinforced. And they are so ready for us to go in and say, hmm, what else is also true about immigrants? Some immigrants come here and collaborate with us. Some immigrants take jobs that a lot of us don't really want. So, so immigrants are not just bad and steal jobs, but immigrants also can collaborate, can work together with us, and they share so many similarities. See, by having this conversation, we expand the biases and we expand those social categories or boxes to include so many other things. So when our little ones grow up and learn more about the diversity and inclusion of so many different people, studies show that, yes, their explicit biases can change to include more equity and liberation. However, the implicit biases, those are so much harder to change, and they tend to stay. And by age 10, our little ones and us often share the same implicit racial biases. More reasons for us to have this conversation right now. And we honor so many parts in, our, in us as parents and caregivers that we want to protect our little ones from the harm and the violence. And we also want to prepare them for the real skills of being just able to survive the violence that's outside. And we also want to move through our discomfort and have this hard talk. All of that while running in between Zoom meetings, while thinking about dinner, juggling so many hats. So Zimon and I wanna share with you these concrete invitation to try the four S's of conversation building blocks. And these four S's include self, 
safety, sense-making, and solution. And how they work together is you can use as many S's as you want in a conversation because you know yourself and your style best and you know your little one best too. So use as many or as little as you would like. And we design these four S's to be trauma-informed. That's why we start with ourselves and we check in and then we use care and connection to provide safety so that we're not overwhelming our little ones and their emerging brain capacity with too much information. And then we end with solution. And we're going to go through each component of the four S's together. So the first S is self. And what this looks like is just checking in with your values. What is it that I want to convey to my little one? What do, what do I hope that they'll understand? Also checking in your energy level. Do I have the energy to do this? Do I have the capacity to do this? Also checking in with your boundaries and safety. How can I convey that they're gonna be safe? How do I convey that this is what we're gonna talk about, that you're in a safe environment, that I'm here for you, and that you also feel the same way and doing this in a way that feels comfortable for you and feels comfortable for your little one. But also checking in with your privilege and your power and your position. How do I use these creatively? How do I think outside the box? And how do I do this from a place of love and care? And so the next S, safety, is really reestablishing safety both verbally and non-verbally. And so having the conversation and reassuring your little one, you're here with me, right? I got you, you're safe. So I know you saw that person yelling and I know it was scary, but we're here now and you're safe. And then that the next S is sense-making, making sense of oppression in one drop or as Nat likes to say, one verse of baby shark, right? So it could be, it's true, we're all special, but sometimes people are treated differently because somebody thought you were something that you weren't, right? That hurts and that's called prejudice. And so this S is really about helping it to make sense to our little ones and make sure it, it makes sense to us too. With making sense, we like to use OWL, right? And that means observe, wait, and listen. So as we're sharing these things, we wanna watch our little ones, watch our kiddos for their reaction, and then wait and really listen to them, right? So we celebrate our holidays differently. But that doesn't mean that any religion is better than the other. And your friend and come and he can come and he or she can come and join us for our traditions and our celebrations next time. And then the solution, right? Exploring actions to safely address the unfairness or those hurt feelings. So when your friend couldn't play on the seesaw, you can invite them to play with you if that's what you want to do, right? And you can say, do you want to take turns on the swing? But really equipping them with ways to handle it and ways to offer us a solution for our little one. And so after the talk, we want to watch for any sudden changes in their behaviors, right? If we're, we're noticing any clinginess or meltdowns or withdrawals, any changes in their sleeping or eating or, or bowel movements. And if you do start to notice any of these changes, that's when we go back to offering that care and connection and the safety. And so after we've had these conversations and we feel really good about it, maybe we want to take it a step further. And we can offer some empathy questions. And we could ask, when someone talks to you like that, how does that make you feel? And that's where we go back to really listening, using those owls. Observe them, wait, and then listen to what they share. Maybe we could use analogies. So many women are strong and they're leaders. 
just like Mulan, remember? Or Pocahontas or Princess Tiana. We can also use examples, right? Remember when your dad and your uncle got into that argument? They had a long talk until they could see where they, where each other was wrong and where they were coming from. And so using family examples can be really helpful. Talking about the pride and the pain. My eye shape is different from yours because I'm from a different part of the world. My mom and dad have the same eye shape and I'm so proud that I get to share this with them. So these are just some extra bonus points after we've really had these conversations just to see how things are with our little ones and where we are too. So your action is the solution, right? There's no right or wrong way. We just practice. We're gonna mess up, fumble, tumble, right? But the cycle goes relapse, rise, repeat. But it starts with that conversation. So we thank you guys so much for taking action towards liberation together. Thank you for being here with us and thank you for sharing in this journey with us. Thank you so much, uh, Simone and Matt. Uh, I was, I don't know if uh, other folks were, but I was sitting here uh, just marveling at some of what you were sharing, the, the frameworks that the four S's that um, really put into uh, an understandable, digestible framework. I think what so many people have talked about is something being really complex um, and challenging. And I, I, I think that, one of the other, I would love to, to start by asking um, one of the questions that came in, but first I wanted to, to mention what you talked about earlier about children forming uh, associations and how those can be really positive associations or really harmful associations as well. And that can happen starting really young. Um, Curious if you can talk more about that for for the little ones, like uh, you know we're all, we're talking about little ones being even you know running a gamut. But when we think about those littlest ones, the babies, um, kind of that zero to one year old or that newer toddler, um, what are some of the things that they're that they're starting to work through and build associations around, and how can we as parents, caregivers, educators? Um, really support positive associations at that young, young age. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, so I would love to start with this idea from the evolution standpoint that a lot of us always do this social categorization of who's safe and who's dangerous so that we can understand what to do with whom in each situation. And from a brain development standpoint, our newborns are born ready to distinguish between who looks different and who looks familiar. So in that zero to six months in the beginning, a lot of our babies grow up with same race grownups. <laughs> so they prefer those who look very similar to them. And then from the period of six to nine months, they start to develop such strong preference for people in group or people who share the same characteristics and traits. And when that development is really forming, we start to see biases really coming on very strongly during the two to five years, which we might see if you're around the playground or in a preschool classroom, you might see social exclusion or name calling or using skin color and hair texture or garments to exclude friends from playing together. Another um, question that came in, uh, and I, I've heard this, I've heard this one before uh, as well is that, uh, you know, uh, su support like this, guidance like this, um, you know, a parent or caregiver um, might be sort of ready to, to take it and, and use it and start to put it into action. 
but then be worried about the other grown-ups in their or adults in their life who their child might be exposed to as well, who might um, not have some of the same information or might say things that they know are harmful. And I was thinking, Simone, about you, you know, what you were talking about, about the color blindness and uh, right, thinking about um, that, that parent maybe who's thinking, gosh, but when my child's with their grandparent, this is, they get such a different message. Can you speak a little bit to advice that you would give to, to folks who are in that place? That is such a good question. And, and it really reminds me of when there are parenting differences in general, or even like differences with discipline. Um, and there's, there's really no easy answer to that. I think this idea of having conversations is super important, especially with the little ones, but also with the other people who are taking care of them. Um, I think we, we shared in the presentation that if you're not having these conversations, then you're a part of it. So I think one of the best things we could do in addition to having conversations with our kiddos is having conversations with those family members as well, but also keeping those four S's in mind and really recognizing, do I have the energy to do this, right? Um, do I have the, the time, the capacity, and what do I wanna convey? But also remembering that it's a journey, right? It's not one conversation that's gonna change everything that it's, it's probably gonna take more than one. It's probably not gonna change their mind immediately, but they know. And, and we like to think of that as planting seeds and we come back and we water it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's so beautiful, Simone, water the seeds. And if I may add, I also, when I water the seeds, I often think to myself, ooh, how can I make this a teachable moment? that it's not only just us looking differently, but we also have different ideas, different feelings, even when we're talking about the same topic. And to throw in some developmental information in there, the idea of theory of mind, where our little ones understand that their goals and plans and actions and emotions can be different from the goals, plans, actions of other people. And that theory of mind is emerging around 18 months. So they do have the capacity and how we water those seeds is up to us. Yeah. I love that too, that uh, planting the seeds and watering them. And it, it makes me think, uh, right, in that idea of it's not going to be one conversation, it's not going to change someone's mind overnight. Uh, but the little one is is hearing that reaction, right, that the the parent or the educator is having and hearing that seed that they're planting and how much of an impact that has on them. Um, I, I love that. Uh, I, I'm also curious uh, you know, I, I, about the how, how you might modify at all, if at all, um, that the 4S framework for an older child, someone who is, um, you know, maybe in that kind of five, six, seven year old stage. Um, I know we have some folks um, here who are, you know, working with more of a school age population. And is there anything that would be different when you're thinking about, you know, a true early childhood infant toddler versus some of those older kiddos? Thank you for that question, Jesse. I think that first of all, even before getting into that, I always encourage caregivers to actually be clear about their boundaries in terms of how much or how little they want to share when it comes to details. Because our grown-ups have a tendency to want to explain about the why and the historical context and the big ideas. And our little ones are more gravitated towards the concrete things. Like who hurt who and how and what happened exactly? Right? So we're kind of holding that tension in mind and set the boundaries of, okay, I'm just going to share this much because I don't want to overwhelm them with the graphics and the details. And for the little, little ones, I often gauge their understanding that perhaps I can say, 
first X happens, then Y happens because of Z. For our older ones, the Z or the because might, might be more nuanced that, oh, it happens because A, B, and C, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's such a great point, Nat. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought that up. And I think it would also be great to kind of keep in mind the, the OWL acronym because they have more language, because they may have a bit of a better understanding. So really observing them and listening to them and when you can, incorporating the language that they use so that it's familiar, they have context and they have something that they can better understand. But yeah, I agree with you, Nat. I, I love that, uh, focusing on the language they're using. I think that's something that uh, in, at Vosel in our classes, we all often talk about how um, parents, uh, caregivers know the children in their lives so well um, and know them best and um, are, that, that's such a, I think, instinctual thing for so many parents and caregivers to mimic back what their children are saying. And so remembering that that's something we do in other contexts and, and why not here as well, right? Really pay attention to what children are saying. Uh, it, it makes me think back to my little one who's uh, who just turned four, but when when he was three, we uh, we talked about you know the the racial injustice of last summer um, amidst everything else that was going on for generations. But talked about that, and we were talking and talking, and then he, I said, "What do you think about that?" And he said, "I don't know." And I realized we had gone too high, right? And that, and what you were talking about, we've gone too big picture, um, and so. I, I really appreciate that also push to stay concrete with these little ones and talk about what they're seeing. That's great. Yes. Uh, oh, Jesse, you, you reminded me of so many times when I have prepared this beautiful lecture about racism to talk to my preschoolers back in the day and I nailed it. And I was so proud. And then most of the times the little one just said, okay, so what's for snack? So this is where the baby shark technique was born. Is that, okay, I'm just going to give you bite sized and then observe, wait, and listen. Yeah. And that takes pressure off of me too, from having to have the whole thing figured out. Yes. I love that. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes. So if anyone who is listening in has a specific question, don't worry if it's, you know, you can submit it anonymously via Q&A if you'd like or put it in the chat. Um, but um, one question I have, um, Simone and Nat, that, that based on your, your experience, you both have so much experience working with parents, caregivers, educators, and I'm curious what you've seen is hardest for, for the people, the grownups, what you've seen. Um, so I think that can be so validating for the folks in the room who are also feeling like this might be hard. So where have you seen people kind of struggle? I'll start. Um, the hardest thing I've seen is starting. Mm -hmm. Just starting the conversation because there's always the thought that I'll just do it later or you know what, they're not old enough. I'll just wait until they're a little older and just just really starting the conversation um, and understanding what it is that's keeping you from wanting to start. So for those of you who haven't started the conversation, it's okay, we get it. Yes. And if I can add to that, Simone, is that you've already done half of it, teaching your little ones how to be kind, how to be honest, how to be punctual, how to treat other people with compassion. And with this conversation, it's going another step further and taking a little bit more risk and making it specific to oppression because it's already there and our little ones are already noticing it. And Another point that just came to my mind is some parents said that, you know, but my little ones don't ask me about these things and there's no opportunity or reason for me to engage them in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And 
to that point, it's so real. And I hope that we can take a, a step back further and really understand, well, why is there no opportunity for us to have this conversation? Mm. Because it's not just us or individualistic action. Think about redlining and zoning and segregation in our community and in our school and understand those macro level pictures. A, to take pressure off of ourselves and B, to really motivate us into action that, yeah, even though they're not asking us about these things and we're preventing them from watching the news and all the graphics, more reasons for us to intervene and set that structure and poke and prompt this conversation to take place Mm -hmm. in a developmentally informed way, in a trauma informed way. There's uh, two questions just came in that I think relate to what you were just saying about that developmentally appropriate way. Um, and so I'm going to share both. You can you can decide if you want to combine these or, or answer them separately. Um, the one is about asking to hear a specific example of a, a conversation or, or an explanation that you might give, or maybe an example of an explanation that might be too much versus one that seems to be really you know, concrete for preschool kids. Um, but then the other question is more about um, the recent uh, instances of police brutality and how to developmentally appropriately uh, respond if a child asks about that um, or maybe hears something about it and then asks. Um, so I, they could go hand in hand, those two questions, but curious for your thoughts on that. For, for our folks in the room. So I'm going to try. So please give me permission to stumble and fumble as well as I go along with this. Absolutely, um, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So with police brutality example, I will start checking with myself. Okay, I have the energy level to do this right now with a lot of presence. And then I move into safety and I will validate my little one saying that, you know, it could be so scary and confusing to see a police officer who you think is here to protect all of us, hurting people. Pause, wait, listen. And then I move into sense making and help them understand that even though we understand that police officers are here to protect us, but sometimes not all of them do that. And sometimes it's so harmful in some neighborhoods and communities. What do you think? And I might relate to some personal examples that, oh, you know, it's like sometimes you really want to be good and you want to share toys with your friends, but you really have a bad day and you're not your best self. And sometimes you just don't behave in ways that you want. And that happens to so many of us. And then I move into thinking about solutions, right? When you have this down days when you don't really act in ways that you really believe in, what do you do? What can we say to ourselves together What can we do to remind ourselves? Or when you see your classmates doing something that is not going in alignment with the classroom's expectations, what can you say? Maybe you can say, hey, stop, that hurts my feelings. Or is there anyone in the classroom you can go and talk to? So I always kind of link it back to their daily lived experience, especially at home and in the classroom and add a few metaphors, even though that someone having a bad day and not acting and behaving in alignment with their value is not with the same gravity or parameter of police brutality at all. Mm -hmm. But it's the overarching ideas of not everyone is behaving in the same way that we expect. And that's the key for our little toddlers, because they understand the idea of unfairness. That was so, that was very helpful. Thank you for, uh, it it was for me. I hope it was for the folks who asked those questions. Uh, 
I, I think a couple of things that I heard that I want to just emphasize um, that you paused after, I think it was after safety or after one of the S's, you said I would pause and listen. Uh, and that goes back to what we were just talking about, right? Of like having this whole planned lecture um, and how the parents, caregivers, educators, I think so can easily fall into that. Um, and instead, just giving time to hear where they're at. Maybe they say something back that's going to take you a different direction or whatnot. Um, I love that. Um, and also that uh, what I heard from you in the response is that it you didn't attempt to cover everything in that one exchange, right? Uh, we didn't because, right, anytime I think about police brutality, it thinks about systemic racism and um, right uh, generational uh, all these things and you didn't attempt to go into all that with um, in that one conversation I think that's so so powerful and helpful um, so thank you uh, I, I think that uh, I, in, I see some folks in the chat also saying this that's helpful um, I guess we're we're about five minutes to go. So if there is any last question in the chat, throw it in there. Um, otherwise, Nat, Simone, um, any any other final thoughts that you really wanted to share tonight that haven't haven't come up? Um, anything else from you? This is it was just wonderful. Go ahead, Simone. Yeah, no, I was I was just going to share that um, these import these conversations are really important to have, um, and I think we shared that it is trial and error, and the great thing about it is you get another chance and another mm -hmm. chance and another chance, <laughs> but the key is to start, and I, it's wonderful that you all are even here. This is this is a great start. To begin to have those conversations so thank you for being here absolutely thank you both so much i yeah. am taking that away right we we start small we plant seeds uh we use those four s's they, thank you so much for being with us tonight uh and sharing sharing your wisdom and guidance with us it's been just such a gift so thank you very much to both of you uh and I will share my screen one more time here for everyone who's on with us um, and, and tell you that as amazing as tonight was, we have three more of these coming up in the next few months. Um, these master classes have been, uh, I know, such a gift um, for me at Bocell and for our Bocell community to bring this content that uh, we think really it shouldn't be locked up in textbooks or um, housed in really expensive uh, college courses or counseling sessions or whatever, all the other great places that, yes, this content can come, but want to make sure it really reaches everyone out there who is working with young children. And so the three other topics that we have coming over the next few months are here on your screen. Uh, at the end of May, we will be uh, talking with Elise Zavala, who is an occupational therapist, who will be joining us to talk about sensory play and thinking about a child's sensory diet throughout the day um, and really thinking about also the big body movement that they need and how we can provide that as grown-ups for them. Um, then we'll be switching to a topic around early math, um, thinking about what skills matter most um, to prepare young children to, to really thrive in a school setting. And so we'll do that at the end of June. And then the end of July, uh, have a topic that was also highly requested by our community around um, healthy eating for young children, picky eaters, and how to navigate um, some of those struggles. So we'll have those three topics coming up. We hope that you will follow along with us, that you will join the master classes, but that you will also spread the word. Um, we have tried to ensure that um, cost is not a barrier for anyone to come to these classes. So pay what you can, please spread the word. Um, if you are not already following us on Instagram or Facebook, um, we are at Bowsell Kids. Um, and so we post about about all of our classes and uh, you can follow along there. Uh, thank you so much to Nat and Simone again for joining.
thank you to all of you for joining us here tonight. Uh, and we hope to keep in touch with you and see you again next time. Have a great night.